1 Samuel Amen. chapter 15, starting at verse 10, you'll find these words. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, mm -hmm. for he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night, dropping down to verse 22. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, mm -hmm. and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion mm -hmm. is as the sin of witchcraft, mm -hmm. and stubbornness yes. is as the iniquity of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Mm -hmm. Living by God's authority, part two. Amen. Amen. Living by God's authority. All authority begins with God. Amen. Whether it be the human body, the nuclear family, the local church, civil government, or God's eternal kingdom, it all begins with God. Leadership authority is necessary to good order, for smooth function, in order to get things accomplished. The alternative is disorder, chaos, and anarchy. Leadership with delegated authority is God ordained. Genesis 1.26, let man rule over the fish, the birds, the livestock, over all the earth and all the creatures. This godly order is also evident in earthly relationships. Husband and wife, parent and child, leader and community, leader and the church, employer, employee. On last week, we discussed three areas of institutional authority. There's family authority. Mm -hmm. God expects children to recognize on the basis of their position. According to Exodus 20 and 12, honor your father and your mother. Ephesians 6, 1 and through 2 says, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Well, there's a qualification with the word obey. There's no qualification with the word honor. You honor your parents because they're your parent. They're in that position of authority. Not because they're Christian, wise, or good. Full respect for your parents is a separate consideration and one that must be earned. However, the latter does not negate the former. That's family authority. But then there's governmental authority. Romans 13, 1 and 2, everyone must submit himself to the authorities, for there is no authority, that's Romans 13, 1 and 2, except that which comes from God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. We are also instructed to pray for our leaders. That's right. Then there's church authority. Hebrews 13 and 7 says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority, for they watch over your souls and men that must give an account. Disrespecting God delegated authority brings judgment on one's life. Makes no difference who we are. Submission to God ordained leadership honors God. Now, there is a place for to exercise conscience and personal conviction as outlined, obviously, in Daniel chapters 3 and 6, in Acts 5 and 25, but they're not to be used as a loophole to do whatever you want to do. Now, way, by way of background, Israel had enjoyed a distinction that no other nation had experienced. 
God was their king and God chose them specifically to lead. He wanted to be their God and king. And as in typical human nature or fashion, Israel wanted what they didn't have. They wanted a human king and was no longer satisfied with God being their king. God chose Saul to be the first king of Israel. It was God who sent the prophet Samuel out to find Saul and to anoint him to be king. From the very beginning, Saul had a problem. He just never could seem to obey God's commands. From the beginning, yeah, he made a habit of partial obedience when it came to the commands of God. He would do some of what God commanded, but he would never do all of what God commanded. King Saul had been commanded by God through the prophet Samuel to go and war against the Amalekites. Samuel was very clear in these commands of God, destroy everything. This was plain and clear and to the point the Bible says utterly destroy all that they have, amen, and do not spare them. Saul engaged the enemy and destroyed all the people, but, amen, amen, but proceeded to amen, spare the king mm -hmm. and the best sheep and the oxen and the lambs and all the things that were, he was good. Uh, he didn't want to completely wipe away with all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. 1 Samuel 15, 9 says that, amen, they destroyed everything worthless and that was despised, but they were unwilling to destroy anything that appeared to be good in their own eyes. And this is happening, amen, amen. As this is happening, the prophet Samuel hears from God. And the message is not good. Come on, I've discovered in my reading through the Bible, wherever God had a king, mm -hmm. he always had a prophet to speak truth amen. to that king. Amen. And so God has his prophet speak to his king. And God begins to speak to the prophet and says, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned his back from following me and has not, amen, performed my commandments. We are told that it grieved Samuel so much that he cried out to the Lord all night long. And as he faced Saul the next day, Saul greeted him with a, what I call a smoke screen type of greeting. He comes, amen, with a big smile on his face because they won the battle. And he says, blessed are you of the Lord, talking to the prophet. Yeah. I have performed the, the commandment of the Lord. Saul makes his declaration, but Samuel gives him a classic, amen, pointed response. If you have obeyed God's commandment, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? If you have really obeyed God, why am I hearing things still alive? Before we get down on Saul too much, allow me to just stick a pin in for a moment and allow me to take a moment just ask you a few questions this morning before we get on Saul too heavy here. <laughs> Are you following God's command? Are you living a life of partial obedience to God's commands? Do you find it easier to be obedient when you know people are looking? Have you been struggling with some area of your life that you need to be surrendered to Almighty God? God speaks in all kinds of ways to all kinds of people. I believe this message has been laid across your pathway this morning by God, amen, for a very important reason. For some of us, it's a warning to stay away from things that are displeasing to God or go against God's word. For others, it is a call to stop and to examine your ways, to reflect honestly on your lifestyle, and to ask the simple question, am I living in obedience to God's word and God's way? In other words, am I living by the authority of God? Mm. Now, don't try to deflect from the question like many of us try to do by trying to justify a partial obedient lifestyle by listing all the things that you do. Oh, we're so quick to list the things that we do. Oh, I go to church every Sunday. I even work in the church. I sing in the choir. I play in the band. I teach a class. I serve God most of the time. 
<laughs> However, the last time I checked, that is not the standard for obedience with God. Partial obedience just doesn't cut it. Amen. I know that this church is unique and we try to, amen, extend grace to all people and give, and give them a chance to work on the issues in their life. Amen. May I remind you that our goal and mission as a church is to lead people into a growing relationship with Christ. Our goal is not to hand out a free, illusionary pass to heaven. In other words, you can just live any kind of way you want, and as long as you come and just say three Hail Marys, and you're going on your way to heaven. Growth comes from obedience. The Bible clearly states that if you know, amen, if you, if you, if you listen, if the Bible says that if you know to do good and you don't do it, if you know to do good and you don't do it, that's sin. That means you're disobeying God. One writer stated that it's only through obedience that you come to learn the truth. In fact, he strongly suggests obedience is an act of faith. Are you worried because you find it so hard to believe? No one should be surprised at the difficulty of faith if there's some part of your life that you're consciously resisting and disobeying the commandments of Jesus Christ. Saul begins to make excuses for why he spared them and spared the sheep and the other things. He basically response was, I saved all these animals so we can make a great big sacrifice unto a, a holy and righteous God. Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than to sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Now, as we analyze the reasons for Saul's disobedience, we must look at our lives to consider our own walk in obedience to God. How do I disobey God's authority? Well, first of all, it's when I allow a pattern of disobedience in my life. It's when I allow a pattern of disobedience in my life. He says, I greatly regret that I set up Saul to be king, for he has turned his back from following me and has performed my commands. How is that pattern developed? By certain behavioral traits. First of all, by partial obedience. He obeyed only part of the Lord's command to destroy the people and the livestock. He spared the enemy king and the best livestock. Saul's obedience was not 100% or 95%, but somewhere in there. But the Lord's voice, amen, but the Lord was not pleased with what he had done. But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, he said, and I've gone on the mission field. I've done what he said. Listen, but he did not do exactly what God had told him to do. The bottom line is that he didn't obey completely what God had commanded. Amen. Partial obedience. Then by what? Persuasive denial. Verse 13, when the prophet Samuel caught up with King Saul, he says, listen, I have obeyed. Numbers 23, 32 and 23 says, your sins will find you out. Whatever is done in the dark shall come to the light. You may get away with it for a little while, but it won't be long. The people say you can fool the people some of the time, but you can't fool the people all the time. And I'm here to say you can't fool God any of the time. Right. Amen. Your Amen. sins will find you out. Amen. The bleeding sheep and the lowing cattle gave Saul away. It is not unusual for those who engage in acts of disobedience to become very good at self-denial. Regardless of how persuasive they are, they are only able to convince themselves. Somehow, we are able to convince ourselves that we're doing okay, regardless of what we know to be the truth of God's word. Yeah. And then, by persistently blaming others, <laughs> by persistently blaming others, when called, he showed up was called. He began to blame other people. In verse 15, he says that the soldiers did it. Yeah. In verse 21, he says the people took the plunder. Yeah. <laughs> but if you look at verse 21, not only is he blaming other people, but it is also clear that he understood the commandments of God. Yeah. But the people took the plunder, the sheep and the oxen and all the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God. This 
is the oldest trick in the book. It started with our first brother, Adam, where he didn't want to take the blame for his disobedience to God, and so he tried to blame Eve. Eve said, there ain't no way right. I'm going to turn around and blame the serpent. <laughs> the oldest trick in the book, blaming other people. You do know that we live in a society that, amen, is becoming very acceptable to blame others for our own problems. Amen. When it comes to obeying God, it is not about anybody else. It's not about your past. It's not about your parents. It's not about your terrible relationship with your father or somebody else or whatever. There comes a time when, yes, you may have had a bad past. You may have had some bad relationships, but at some point in your life you had to grow up and now you got to learn to take responsibility for your own action. When it comes to obeying God, it's not because you've been through all of this so God is going to allow this little bit of happiness in your life called disobedience. Not so. It's not about you. It's all about God. And when God gives you instruction, when God puts a declarative statement into your life, there is an expectation from God that you're going to follow what he is saying. Amen. How do we disobey the authority of God? Secondly, when I establish a precedent of disobedience in my life, why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoils and do evil in the sight of the Lord? When do I establish a president of disobedience in my life? When I turn away from the Lord. Verse 11 says, the Lord himself testified against them. The same Saul who was among the prophets when they were prophesying, amen, was anointed king of Israel. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. But here God brought him up from nothing, made him something, and now he's so big he can smell his own B.O. to the point where he can make his own decisions and turn his back and walk away from God. When do we disobey God? When we turn and walk away from the Lord. But then when we turn to pride. Pride comes into our heart. In verse 17, he was once small in his own eyes. And then God could use him when he was small. When they asked him and called him to be king, and hey man, he's the one that ran and hid in the baggage car. Said, no, no, surely you won't want me. You want somebody else. When he was small, he was humble, and God can use him. It's amazing how sometimes God gives people position in life, and after a while, it turns into pride. I earned this. I deserve this. This belongs to me. Brother and sister, we need to learn something. God had people in place before we came on the scene, and when we closed our eyes for the last time, and they close that casket and the dirt hits the casket, God has somebody already sitting in the pulpit waiting. Amen. God buries his workmen and then goes on with his work. The Lord had lifted him up, but now his pride has become his downfall. Did not Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. How many people have you seen where, amen, God raised up, but pride got a hold of the heart and it wasn't long. You see, I've discovered that Satan will elevate you quickly. He lifts you up high as he can so everybody can see you, so he can pull the rug out from underneath you and let you fall. But I've discovered that God takes you down first before he lifts you up. He takes you down to humble you. So you can have the humility of character to hold on to the blessings and the position he wants to put you in. Amen. Then when, when, when I turned to fear, he was afraid of the people. In verse 24, he feared the people, so he gave in to them. The people were leading him instead of him leading the people. How many times must I say this and just pause out for the, some of the ministers that may be listening on tape. Well, amen. A lot of times it's so easy to get this thing twisted. Where you can jump out in front of the people and wherever the people want to go, you're trying to lead them where they want to go. That's not called leadership. Sometimes you got to lead people where they don't want to go. As long as God is leading you there first. That's the reason the Apostle Paul can say, follow me as I follow Christ. Fear of man 
Amen. Proverbs 29 and 25. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. Mm. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Mm. The safety is not being in front of the people. The safety is being behind the Lord. Amen. When you stand behind the Lord, no matter what comes your way, you're able to stand up. Yes, I share with many ministers, when you learn to lay before God, you can stand before any man. Amen. You don't have fear in your heart. When we are required to come to a time and place in our society where we are not ashamed to follow God's way. There's a time, and wait a minute, God will call you to do something yeah. that just won't make common sense. <laughs> it makes better sense to do it this way when God said do it that way. Yeah. But there comes a time in our lives where we got to grow and mature and say, well, if God said do it this way, then do it. Whether it makes sense or not, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Did not the prophet Isaiah declare in Isaiah 55 and 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, <laughs> nor your ways, my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heaven as far as the heaven is from the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God says, I know better about how things ought to be done than all of the business acumen that we may think we have that we bring to the process. It's so easy to get in a group and in a group discussion and decide, this committee going to decide, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to do it. And never pray and seek God's face and seek God's direction. Amen. Amen. Did not Paul declare in Romans 11 and 32, for God had committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all? All the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out? For who have known the mind of the Lord? Who have known the mind of the Lord? Who has become his counselor? Who has ever, amen, given to him first, and now he's got to repay them and pay them back? In other words, who has God had to sit down on somebody's couch and be counseled by them? And God had to explain all his troubles with who? Who has been God's counselor? Who had God had to go through and get a little loan from, amen, and sign some mortgage papers on the earth? Who did God have to go to? Now God's got to pay back a mortgage. For him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen. 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 I don't know about you, but I'm so glad about that. Yes. That I serve a God that knows exactly what he wants done, how he wants done, knows how to speak so clear to somebody's heart if you just listen to what God's saying. And listen, and there's no failure in following God. As we discovered last week, we live in a society of very few absolutes. We live in a society that has taught us that situational ethics is the way to conduct our lives. That's just who we are. It just makes sense to us today. It's not God's way. It's not God's thoughts. But that's man's way. In other words, we have been taught that if you get in a situation and you need to lie to get out, as long as it's a little white lie, it's okay. If I don't lie on this application, I'm not going to get that job. If I don't lie on them loan papers, I'm not going to get this house. And I know God wants me to have this house. <laughs> so I'm just going to lie and get it. And once I get it, I'm going to go down to that church and ask for forgiveness. <laughs> Situational ethics. The person who really endeavors to live by God's authority really? will stand out in today's society. Really? I'm talking about really being a Christ follower, oh. not a chameleon, not blend in with the world all during the week and they come on Sunday morning and blend in with the church. When you're real, you're going to have very few friends in this world because they're going to demand that you show Amen. some dirt in your life. They don't want to hang around with you unless they show some dirt. Because they know in their life they got some dirt and they want to see some dirt on you. And unless they can see some dirt on you, then I'd be happy to be around you. Man. Saul prioritized religion over obedience. In verse 15, he thought that the Lord would be very happy to receive the sacrifices over the slight disobedience and sparing a few animals, which are going to die anyway a little bit later. Perhaps 
Perhaps these trophies of war included the king as well. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That would add to his stature. Look, I captured the king. Mm -hmm. Come on, Pastor. What happens when I disobey God's oh. authority? I'm required to pay the price of disobedience. I'm required to pay the price Amen. of disobedience. Sometimes we find ourselves paying the price and we're not able to see it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We're paying the price for our disobedience, but we can't even see it. Sad. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord. That's right. And the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. The price is more than Saul wanted to pay. Yeah. Even after he acknowledged his sin in verse 15, this only happened when he was confronted with the seriousness of his sin. It is the old game of, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm sorry I got caught. <laughs> <coughs> I'm not sorry that I disobeyed God. He asked Samuel for forgiveness. But he did not seek God's forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 17 says, Godly sorrow bringeth repentance that leadeth to salvation and leaves no regret. Yeah. But worldly sorrow brings death. Yeah. Confessing to your brothers and sisters is a good thing to do. But don't forget to confess to Almighty God. He was more interested in restoring his own personal honor in front of the people than the following God. He acknowledged his sin. He asked Samuel for forgiveness. And then he had to abdicate what God had given to him. Behold, obey is better than sacrifice. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is iniquity as idolatry. Rebellion, to rebel against God, is just like practicing witchcraft. Yeah. It's divination. Yeah. That's the way God sees it. God says, when I give my word and I speak my word to you, listen, I expect you to follow it. And when you rebel against my word, when you turn your back from what I called you to do, listen, that's like practicing witchcraft. Because you're doing what you want to do yourself. You're saying that you know better than God. Wow. Come on, preacher. Come on. Stubbornness. Yeah. Stubbornness. Rebellion. It's presumption, it's arrogance, it's defiance, it's self-will. I know better than God for my life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. God says, do not do this. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Why? I know better. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. When you're hard-headed, it's just as bad as doing evil. And he calls that worshiping idol. Mm -hmm. The kingdom was torn from Saul and given to David. Even though he continued to be king until his death, yeah. the kingdom was gone. He had to pay the price. He had to pay the price. Can you see today the consequences of disobedience in your own life? God took what was Saul's. He says, and I'm giving it to your neighbor down the street. God already has somebody picked out to take up what you were supposed to do. More than all the sacrifices and religious observance, God wants us to obey. We can talk about how we praise God, how we worship God, all the things we do. We can get a legal pad, amen, single space, a double sided, amen, of all the things we do for God. But God says, listen, are you obeying what I want you to do? Amen. Are you obeying God in every area of your life? Jesus says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. God, listen, is God looking for people who will simply follow him? God is simply looking for people who will follow him. Without questioning him, without debating him, 
without second guessing him. God is looking for people who will simply follow him in all of our lives. He is looking for men and women, boys and girls, who will take the word of God seriously and live out the principles and the commands found in the book. God is looking for obedience, genuine, fresh face, what? Obedience. Yes, sir. There are people sitting in here this morning that are living their lives in the most up and down fashion they can. Your spiritual walk and journey resembles a roller coaster. One day you're up and the next day you're down. I want to be very careful here because all of us experience emotional fluctuations in our lives as we walk with God. But I'm talking about ups and downs when it comes to disobeying what God has commanded you to do. Because when you look in that one passage, he's, amen, God, amen, he says that I regret because he has not, what, held to all of my, what, my commandments. Mm -hmm. But then when Saul answers, he says, I've kept the Lord's commands. God says commandments, S plural. He says, I commit, com committed, the, uh, I kept the Lord's command, singular. One. God is looking for people that says, whatever I tell you to do, however much I'm telling you to do, I expect you to do all that. Mm. Don't just do the portion you want to do. Just the portion that you think is right and the portion you think is beneficial. God says, keep it all. Mm. Why? You cannot live a victorious Christian life if you continually to disobey God. Amen. It's not going to happen. Listen, you may get away for, for a little while, and a lot of times we think that punishment delayed is punishment denied. That's a lie right out of the bowels of hell. Sometimes God allows things to go a long period of time, extending grace and mercy, giving you a time to get it right, to confess and get right before God. But we, but we take it as arrogance and pride that God is co sign on my sin, God is co sign on my disobedience, and we're walking around with our eyes bucked out, amen, our wallets full, full, full of path. But listen, when you disobey God, listen, the punishment and the judgment of God is on its way. Amen. Amen. You cannot disobey God and get away with it. Obedience could be for some of us the very step that enables us for our lives to change this morning. You think you're good people. And I bless that. I pray that you are. But God could be saying to you, there's something in your life where you're not obeying me. You're doing all these good things, but you've got this little area of your life that you've carved out for yourself. That's acceptable to you. God says, I want you to clean that up. But look, God, I'm doing this, 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 and this. God says, look at this right here. I want you to clean that up. Well, tell me what it is, man. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit's telling you while I'm talking what it is. You know exactly what it is. You don't want to hear it, but he's pointing it right out of your head. You can't get it out of your head. God says, I want you to carve that out, get it out of your life, and, listen, and obey me. Amen. Obey me. Amen. God said this, but I want to do that. God says, get it out of your life. Amen. God created you and he expects you to follow life that he's laid out before you. Amen. Matthew 22 and 37, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Every terrible step in Saul's life can be traced back to disobedience. Yeah. Everything that went wrong in Saul's life, you can point it back to disobedience. There was a time when he, amen, he, he was waiting on the man of God to come. The man of God didn't come as soon as he wanted, so he's going to put sacrifice. He's going to step in a position that was not his. <laughs> amen. Disobedience has cost this man all his life, even to the point of his death was a direct result of disobedience. He once enjoyed the blessings of God. He was handpicked by God to be king. He had a personal prophet that God put a man of God in his life to be able to speak plainly into his life, clearly what God wanted him to do. But he made the choice to disobey and to live life the way he wanted to live life. And listen, and he had to pay the price for it. Oh, he had a title, he had a position, but he was no longer king. Listen to me this morning as I come to a close. Everyone in this building has been chosen by God. When God sent his son Jesus Christ to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, he did it for each and every one of us. He handpicked you to receive his mercy. He left you his word to guide you, listen, and so that you may live life by it. The question, the question we're, we're asking this morning, listen, amen, as you allow God to examine your life and your heart, 
Amen. Are you living by his word? Are you still holding on to that one area? It's just that one area, and you know exactly what it is. But pastor, that's so little and compared to everything else. Not to God. Amen. To God, it's everything. To God, it's like witchcraft. Amen. To God, it's like idolatry. Because you're worshiping this one thing more than you want to worship him altogether. And God says it's in the wrong place. Get rid of it. Amen. Are you obeying what you know you should do? Are you doing what God demands of you? Obey him and live. Reject him and go your own way and continue to live a devastation and live a defeated life. Your life is on the way to devastation and defeat if you're living in rebellion to God. If you're being stubborn, your life is on its way to devastation and defeat. Listen, as I close this thing out, a TV camera crew was assigned in Southern Florida filming the widespread destruction a while back of Hurricane Andrew. In one scene, Amidst all the devastation and all the debris, there was one house that was still standing on its foundation. Mm -hmm. The owner was outside cleaning up his front yard, but his house was still there. All the other houses on the blocks were wiped out. The reporter came up there with the camera and he says, Sir, why is your house, the only house on this block, still standing? He says, Well, I really don't know, but I, I tell you what, I built my own home. And when I went down to the county, they told me that they gave me a building code. And they told me if I build according to this code, it'll stand and withstand a hurricane. Yeah. And where it said put two by six trusses, I put two by six trusses. <laughs> where it says put two by eight floor joists, I put two Church. by eight floor joists. Amen. When it said go drill down, amen, two feet and put pillars down the ground, two yeah. feet, yeah. I drilled out two feet and put it down there. Yeah. I followed the code exactly the way it was. That's right. right. So when the storm came, Come on. Come on. amen, Come on. and the wind blew, oh, yeah. and the rain came, yeah. it stood right there. Yeah. The other houses, maybe somebody over there didn't follow the code. I follow the code. I'm here to declare to somebody here today, as you build your life, build it according to the code of God's holy word. Because the storm of life will come. It is sure enough come. It will come through sickness and disease. It will come through finance. It will come through broken relationships. It's going to come. And if your life is built on the code of God's holy word, it will stand no matter what comes this way. But if your house is not built upon Jesus Christ and the solid word of God's word, listen, when the months, rains come and the floods come, it's going to beat against it anymore. Your house is going to just wash away like the rest of the houses. I ask you today, is your house built on Jesus Christ? Is your house solid? Is your house, amen, are you living that type of life where you're totally sold out? You're totally committed to Almighty God. There are no areas in my life that I can obviously see that the Holy Spirit is convicting me of that I need to relinquish to God. I have totally surrendered my life to Christ. I'm following God the way he wants me to go. Listen, I won't rebel. I won't participate in witchcraft. I'm not stubborn. I'm not hard-headed. I'm not idolatrizing anything. But I'm worshiping the true and the mighty God with my life, with my actions. That's who I am. I ask you today, are you living by the authority of God's word? Are you living by the authority of God's word? Take a moment. Go into the private chambers of your own heart this morning. What does the Holy Spirit say to you? Am I able to convince myself through self-denial that I'm all right? Or is God still whispering in that small little voice, I have something for you to do. And that voice just won't go away. I have something for you to do. Will I hear God and obey? Or will I turn my back on God? Will I turn away? Will I allow my pride to keep me away? What will it take for me to get my heart back with God? I pray that today you want to open up your heart and invite Jesus Christ into your life.